Hey, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The Negotiation. On today's show, we speak with Greg Turner, an industry leader in live sports and entertainment events and venue management in China. He is the founder and managing director at Shenzhen High Performance Event Management, which manages and promotes events at the Shantou University Sports Park. We discuss 1,500 years of sports evolution in China, why team sports have taken longer to develop, the role the government plays, how foreign sports brands can and should connect with the China fan base, and ex- expectations for the upcoming 2022 Winter Olympics in Beijing. Enjoy. You know, the NBA, it's obviously a very commercial driven entity. It's its owners make its rules and its owners and the commissioner decide how the league is going to develop and grow. Whereas the CBA, by its nature, it's the governing body for basketball in China. And they just happen to have a league on top of that. So it would kind of be like Hockey Canada running the NHL. But even more so, it's the government running Hockey Canada, running the NHL. That's an important thing to keep in mind. And that's true across almost any sport is that it's very clearly written in any kind of government document you see is that the associations, which are quasi-government, are responsible for running whatever sport you're going to be dealing with. Home to over 4 billion people, the Asia-Pacific region boasts one of the most powerful consumer markets on the planet. Not only is it home to half the world's under 30 population, but it's also home to more than half the world's internet users. It's a market no globally minded brand should ignore. But entering markets like China is no easy task. Just ask the likes of Microsoft, Google, Uber and Facebook. Times are changing and with the right partners, doors are slowly opening as more and more companies find success expanding into the markets of the Middle Kingdom. I myself spent eight years in China, mostly as a venture capitalist, helping early stage tech companies enter the Asia Pacific market successfully. This show is dedicated to uncovering and examining successful China entry and growth strategies by interviewing the people behind those success stories. My name is Todd Embley, and welcome to The Negotiation, brought to you by WPIC Marketing and Technologies. Greg, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on today. Hey, it's great to be here. How about we start with a little bit of a self-introduction? Tell us about yourself. Tell us how you ended up in China and tell us what you're doing there. Sure. So uh, I've been here in China for about 20 years. Um, I came here after graduating from the University of Calgary, basically decided I didn't want to work in the oil and gas industry. And anybody who knows anything about Calgary knows mm. that the oil and gas is all there is to do there. Yeah. So I studied international relations in, in UFC and China was my world focus. I decided I'd come over and give it four months to try it out and see what it was all about. Went to Harbin first, lived there, did a school program, traveled around the country for a bit. Then I moved to Beijing where I did an internship for Air Canada, lived there for about a year and a half before packing my bags in 2002, I think it was, and moved to Shanghai. And that was right before SARS. So that was really a a fun time. Um, Once I got to Shanghai, I I started up a hockey club there. And that kind of got me introduced to some people that were trying to get sports marketing started up in China. And uh, I got my involved. That's where I first started my involvement in sports and live entertainment. I lived in Shanghai for about 13 years. First of all, doing, you know, branded sports activation events and then starting to run some of our own events. We did some rugby, some running, some motorsports. Mm-hmm. I got into some venue management. Uh, there's a now would be a hundred year old stadium in Shanghai called Jiangwan Sports Center. I was brought in to run, run a team to basically modernize that in around 2007, 2008 and reopen it to the public as a modern sports facility. And then in about 2013, I had the chance, 2012, sorry, 2012, I had the chance to work for a lady named Yang Yang, who's China's first ever gold medal winner in the Winter Olympics. She was a short track speed skater and she has a vision, um, many visions, but one of the visions and the one that I was trying to work on was uh, developing ice sports as a, at a grassroots level in Shanghai. And she had an ice rink there that we, uh, that I, that I ran. And then we started doing some, uh, figure skating programs, some speed, short track speed skating programs and some hockey programs to try and get more kids playing hockey there. I did that for about a year before I was recruited by the Li Kaxing Foundation to move down to a city called Shantou in South China, where Li Kaxing is from. And he has invested over a billion US dollars there since, um, 2000, since 1984 and the start of the reforms building a university there, building a bunch of bridges, a bunch of hospitals, you know, basically trying to make sure the infrastructure keep up. And I was there to help him open up, build and open up a 6,000 seat NBA standard arena with attached 180 room hotel. Um, I was brought in to oversee the project from an operational point to make sure that everything in the arena was built to the real operational value, build a team, build a business plan, build an operation plan, open it up 
and then I ran it for about two years. In our last year, 2018, we had about 50 events there. So that was quite successful for what at the time was a still is actually a, a third tier Chinese city, a lower third tier Chinese city. That was a really exciting project for me to work on for about five and a half years. And then for about the past two and two years, I've been here in Shenzhen, where uh, I've opened up my own company, basically using all the experience I've gained over my time in China to to help companies that are interested in China's live event, sports and live event industries to either enter the market or else to better understand if they're already here to better understand the challenges that they're facing, the problems that they're coming up with, and and find solutions that that help them overcome those things. Awesome. Okay. So yeah, I'm, we're on a bit of a sports run here. Yeah. Uh, I mean, with, you know, with the podcast, but I mean, it makes sense with the Olympics coming up because it's, it's starting to slowly dominate, uh, you know, the airwaves proverbially. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's something that a lot of people are starting to talk about and ramp up towards. So, um, it's great to have you and your 20 years experience in China to be able to add so much color and context to this discussion. I want to tap into your historical knowledge a little bit. I know that you have some interesting uh, understanding and knowledge, uh, as I do a little bit too, but I'll, I'll hold back and let you go first. Talk to us a little bit about where sports entered uh, into China, how it how, how sports became a thing in China, some of the background and context of China's embrace or lack thereof of sports over the last you know 50 100 years mm -hmm. so i think i think first the most important thing to to lay out right away is that just saying sports in china is it operates a lot differently than what we're used to it's very government driven government policy lays the front framework for how it's going to be developing and that kind of thing dates back to 1918 when Mao Zedong the first paper he ever got published was on the lack of personal fitness for chinese people and how that was impacting their ability to to build a strong nation and uh you know that kind of set the tone for for sports development as china you know went through the revolution and 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 all of this to all of the years since then it's really set the tone for how sports one of the main drivers for sports development in china is that personal fitness is always top of the top of the heap for for attention within uh within the government and the policy they produce and then I would say after that, probably uh, in another important step in, in the history was in the 1950s when the Soviets and the and the, so and the Chinese were uh, developing a really close, strong relationship. There was a lot of uh, emphasis put on the Soviets on the need for strong communist nations to be able to perform at the top of, of international sports competitions, show the real power of, of the people and, and communism to develop you know, such great athletes and strong people and stuff like that. And China really took that on. And that's where you get the other pillar of, you know, where government policy comes from. And that's developing a strong Chinese nation in, in international sports competitions. Um, we've especially seen that, as, you know, since 2008 with the Beijing Olympics. But it's always been when they, when they get involved in a sport, they want to show everybody that they're that they can do it better than anybody else and uh or as good as anybody else i should say not better and so that's where you uh you know those are the two pillars of of, of how ch the of what china sports industry is based on general fitness personal fitness and uh, a strong elite sports sports athlete development mm -hmm. why do you think that sports team sports uh really hasn't just boomed or blossomed and i i think we could ask the same of a, of a lot of countries around the world this just happens to be a podcast mostly about china um you know we could ask yeah. the same thing about india you know massive yeah. population thing but any rhyme or reason that you know of or could think of or even give your opinion on of just why sports has been uh, a little bit left behind or secondary on the priority list uh, in china for so long Team sports, individual sports, they're probably related. And that's that, you know, when kids are really young, they have an opportunity to play sports and, and be regular kids and, and, and run around a lot and stuff like that. And then when they get to around middle school, testing becomes a lot more serious. Classwork becomes a lot more serious. And they just don't have the time to participate in team sports, especially, right? They Maybe they can still sneak out and run around a track a little bit sometimes, or maybe they can still do little bits and pieces, but they don't have the same base development base that that we're used to in the west um they'll pick it up again in, in university or maybe once they start working they'll join a, a local football club or a local basketball team or something but they just don't have the same those formative years where you really learn the importance of how a team works together they just don't have that so i think that's one thing and on the other side you have 
the elite sport development where you have, you know, again, at, the, at about that same time where people's, where kids testing becomes so much more serious, then suddenly they, if you're really good at a sport, you get recruited and you get put into a sports school. And then that's all you do is you just practice that sport. But what happens there is that it's focused so much in developing the individual talent rather than looking to see how a team can work together. And the athletes are just drilled, drilled, drilled on individual skills uh, without putting a lot of time into um, building a team and, and, and the strategy around running the team. Let's talk a little bit about how China's sport industry is set up. You, you, you kind of mentioned how it's a little bit different between the West and the East and the role of government. Can you lean in a little bit more on how the relationship between government and the sports industry is kind of defined and the roles they play? Sure. So I think that we can do that probably easiest by, by contrasting like the CBA versus the NBA. You know, the NBA, it's obviously a very commercial driven entity. It's its owners make its rules and its owners and the commissioner decide how the league is going to develop and grow. Whereas the CBA, by its nature, I mean, it's the China Basketball Association. It's the governing body for basketball in China. And they just happen to have a league on top of that. So it would kind of be like Hockey Canada running the NHL. Right. But even more so, it's the government running Hockey Canada, running the NHL. So I think that, you know, that's that's an important thing to keep in mind. And that's true across almost any sport is that it's very clearly written in any kind of government document you see is that the associations, which are quasi government, are responsible for running whatever sport you're going to be dealing with. So knowing that that that's the situation, that's why it's so important to take some time to understand how the government is trying to develop sports. Right now, since I think about 2017, um, the government's been going on with a really strong reform effort for sports. Um, I know one of your previous guests, Radley, he mentioned a few numbers like the the size that they want to grow the market to, but it's so much more than that. Um, it's it's so deep in terms of how it's how it's trying to grow. You know, it's aimed to become one of the the pillars of the new Chinese economy you know, sports consumption and everything that that includes. So as they're shifting away from manufacturing and they're trying to become more of a a balance with service and manufacturing or even more on the service side, sports is seen as part of that basket of industries that's going to develop the national economy and and, uh, help keep growing. Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, sports can help rally patriotism. Yeah. You know, there's there's so many. Absolutely. I mean, and that's a big part of it too. Yeah. I, I think that they've seen the economy, the economic benefit, but there's so much more. Yeah, but but they're really focused on the economic benefit, you know, and they through the economic benefit, they see all the other things coming from that. So as people are buying more sports, whatever they're buying from it, they become more, you know, especially with a strong national team or strong domestic leagues or players succeeding overseas or whatever, they're going to be buying more of that players or that teams or that sports goods. And then they become more connected to that sport and they feel more patriotic, even if they don't play it themselves, even if they're not really that interested in it. And I think that this is something else we could really touch into is what's the difference between a Chinese sports fan and a Western sports fan. Yeah. So, I mean, a Chinese sports fan, uh, a Western sports fan, I mean, like passion is probably the word you'd use to describe a Western sports fan. They just live and die for their team or their favorite player or anything else. Right. And, and they, they're, they play their sport, you know, like, like you mentioned before we started recording, you play, you, you want to play hockey three times a week. One time is not enough. I'm the same way. I want to play hockey three, three, four times a week when I can, but, uh, you know, a Chinese sports fan, they, they like their team. They're probably more connected to the player their favorite player and they'll change teams based on that player just because maybe the player is handsome or, or his guys got some special skill that they really connect to, or there's some memory that they have of, of this certain player doing something very special at one time that they just keep holding on to. But even more so than that, sports is really just one piece of, of an entertainment diet that they have, right? If they have to choose between watching their, their, their favorite player, their favorite team play a game or go watch a movie with friends, it's, it's actually a really, difficult decision, right? And then if you add in dinner, like going for, out for dinner with friends, they're probably going to choose the dinner first and foremost, right? Because, you know, food here, everybody loves food, eating so much. So sports doesn't have that drive, that same passion that we have in the West. And so when international organizations come in here and they try and start building their their brand or their sport or, or whatever they're doing, and they don't connect with, with people the same way they do in the West, you know, they, they kind of sit here, they're kind of left scratching their head going, you know, why don't people care? Why don't they care about what we're about the sport so much? The, but the thing is, they do care, but they just don't have uh, the same connection to it that we do in the West. And that, I think that still goes back to what we discussed earlier with, you know, that missing gap of, of grade eight to high school to university or graduating high school where they just don't have any sports in their lives. 
Okay, yeah, uh, you're absolutely right. Um, I, I want to go back to one thing you said about the reform, right? And I think that's mm-hmm. something that would have caught people's attention. A reform is a, a bit of a polarizing word. Uh, so, yeah. you know, um, and you mentioned kind of a reform of, of China's sports industry. Um, mm-hmm. Can you just talk a little bit more about what is the current reform of China's sports industry looking like and something about maybe like the language of right. China's sports industry? Okay, so let's take this back another step. Then, and, and you know, Xi Jinping is a is a is a football player. He looked. I know I just went through saying there aren't that many passionate football or sports fans in China, but I I believe he's actually a passionate football fan. And back in 2014, when he did a state visit to the UK, I think they made a trip to Wembley Stadium or one of the stadiums in London. And he got out on the field and he started kicking around a football out there. And it was a huge photo op. But even more than that, I think it was the really a massive signal to China that sports mattered, right? He actually took the time to go to this football stadium, get on the pitch, kick a football around a little bit. And, and all those pictures came back to China and let all the people here see that he, he was connected to the sport. And from that, the first step that they took was in, they undertook a reform, a reform for, for football or soccer. Right. And that started in about 2014, 2015. And then from that, once that gained a little bit of traction and they started finding their footing under that, like I said, in about 2017, 2018, they started a reform of all of sports. And it's not the first time they tried to reform sports, but this time it's different, right? It's not just about the, what I mentioned earlier about the traditional pillars, the, the personal fitness and the, and the national pride. It's more about the money. And that's why I think this time it's actually getting traction and it's still proceeding and it's, it's not fizzling out like, private, like previous reforms have. So, you know, it's a 50-year plan. It's going to, or a 40-year plan. It's a plan based out till 2050. It's methodical. It's, it's, it's very step-by-step. Uh, right now, they're in a process where they've developed this plan that they have for 40 pilot cities to help introduce new ways of, of driving and, and promoting sports consumption in China. Um, and they've just identified these 40 cities. And now these 40 cities are publishing their own plans where they're saying on a local basis, what are some of the initiatives that they're going to be taking to drive more sports consumption? So, you know, obviously up in the north, you've got a lot more focus on winter sports. You go out to Hainan and it's all about beach sports and water sports. And then if you get to the interior, it's mountain sports and things. But then you add in things like tourism and you add in things like uh, 5G and digital. They have this concept called Sports Plus and it's Sports Plus Tourism or it's Sports Plus Education or Sports Plus Medicine, um, where they're trying to tie the sports to other parts of the economy to raise everything up together. And this this pilot program, it's it's really init- really unique and it's really something different in terms of the way that they're trying to execute it, where once these pilots are finished, you know, they have a very strong analysis. And then after that, for those that they deem to be uh, achieving the goals that they've set out, they're going to then be rolled out to other cities in the, in the country with similar kinds of characteristics, where hopefully it'll become a, um, something that can quickly move from pretty level state to, to, to blowing up pretty fast. One term I got for China that I really like, and I, I don't remember who said it, but doing business in China is kind of like boiling water or anything in China is kind of like boiling water where there's just nothing going on for a long time. And then all of a sudden everything explodes, right? Because everybody understands that suddenly this is where you're going to be making your money. So everybody jumps in and it just explodes. And I think sports is right on the, the cusp of becoming one of those, those that boiling point. It's going to, that's, it's going to be amazing to watch. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm excited for it. I think this is going to be so helpful. Um, and I think the, the ripple effect through Asia through APAC Mm -hmm. is, is going to be immense. I mean, culturally China is kind of the dominating culture, even down through Southeast Asia. And, Mm -hmm. um, I think they are kind of now, uh, the de facto, uh, kind of running point on all things APAC and the waterfall effect from this quote unquote reform could be even much bigger than we think about um, because we're only thinking about China and what's going to happen there. But I think there'll be a massive ripple effect throughout Southeast Asia. Totally could be. Um, You know, it's difficult to always say, though, because the relationships are to- so sensitive through the region because of all the historical factors. We'll have to we'll have to see. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, yeah. I, I think that, you know, they're just going to they're not going to try. They're not going to influence or try to force, you know, but I think there's going to be a updraft 
um, yeah. that is and once people start i mean it's the same thing anywhere around the world as soon as you sniff economical up gain uh uptake yeah. you know uh well let's let's get in on this then i mean yeah you know for me sports is always you know with everything going on in the world with china and the u.s and and, and all the other issues that political issues that are the world's facing one of the things i always take heart in is that sports can be a great uniter mm. um and we've seen that in the past and i hope that we can see that again in the, as, as we go through the next few years Having China hosting the Olympics, I think that that's going to be a, a, a really could be a very challenging time, but I think it should be a very rewarding time for most of the world. Um, I think that China's, despite all the issues, when the athletes show up, China's going to open their arms with w- wide open and be very warm and very receptive to every single athlete that comes and, and celebrate everybody just like they did in Beijing 2008. I hope that, you know, some of those voices that are saying that uh, boycott, they got to understand the real role of sports shouldn't be to to prevent it should be to encourage and develop right so get your athletes here get the competition going and 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 let it be a, a step to rebuild rather than something to tear down more yeah you know i have this i, I love this kind of this thing with you say with with sports bringing everybody together because you know it's like i'm a democrat well i hate you i'm a republican well i hate you because i'm a democrat it's like wait a minute you love the seahawks yeah bring it yeah. in brother yeah. <laughs> that, exactly what you know? wait what <laughs> you, yeah. yeah man seahawks for life what? you know it could be any team right but that's the power that's the power yeah. of it man Absolutely. And, and, you know, you know, looking back at some of those big Soviet Canada hockey games and stuff like that, I'm sure at the end of those games, even though those players hated each other, they probably walked off the ice with a lot more respect and a lot more understanding of each other than they did before they ever stepped on the ice. Yeah. One of the hardest things I did was, was watch, um, watch the Olympics and, you know, a couple world cups, uh, of hockey when I was in Dalian and I was at a bar full of Russians and yeah. they were they were my <laughs> friends you know my now wife is russian and there was a big russian community and i used to just hang out with them canadians were pretty small amount of people in in, yeah. in dalian so i watched it with and they I me mean, what i've experienced like and and just they wanted it and and it was interesting to watch my wife you know and the russians would lose and canada would win and she would be like we really could have used that we really could <laughs> like it's just we always lose and they had they yeah. have this it was a bit of a defeatist kind of like man like it's just why can't you know you've got Malkin and Ovechkin and 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 all these guys yeah. you know how how would how do we not pull together and win like look at the talent yeah. on this team and and yeah. they're all kind of just like again seriously it's it's just a fantastic that all of it all of the psychology all of the cultural all the socioeconomic everything it's super interesting about sports something yeah. else that's interesting about sports is the live entertainment and that's a fun conversation during covid but we're gonna do it anyway um <laughs> you know let's start you know because you have a, a background with live entertainment a lot obviously all the venues and the yeah. things that you've run can you talk to us briefly about the relationship between culture and sports in china uh characteristics of culture and entertainment events in china bring bring this all to together and then you know if you need a reminder because it's a long-winded question now i will but the challenges faced by foreign organizations in china's live entertainment industry if you could kind of walk us through those those points so you know we just talked a lot about sports and government involvement and stuff like that and the direction that's, that the sports industry takes from the government the live entertainment you know we're talking about music concerts or stage shows or, or you know those kinds of performance performance-based uh, entertainment they don't have the same type of government involvement, but it's still just as cumbersome, right? Where you have to get permits and, and deal with uh, deal with propaganda and censorship and stuff like that. And so in some ways, it's easier to do business in sports, even with all of the government direction and stuff like that, because you know what the rules are, you know what they're going to say. Uh, it's a lot more clear. With live entertainment, the toughest space is, is for foreigners to understand what is going to get their show a permit and what might get it canceled. Right. Because when you're bringing foreign entertainment in, there's always going to be a risk when you go into to the culture bureau and you ask them and, and the propaganda bureau and you ask them for the permit to do this concert, to do this show. Are they actually going to give it to you? Um, there's always a risk there. So that's probably the, the first thing that uh, foreign, you know, for foreigners, that's 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 tough for us to understand because we just see it as oh, I just want to bring the Rolling Stones in. Why can't they sing sing Brown Sugar? That was one of the I don't know if you're if you 
were around or if you heard the story, but when the first time the Rolling Stones came to China, um, there was, I think, three or four songs that the government just said, you're not allowed to sing. And Brown Sugar was one of them. In the press conference before the before the show, somebody, one of the media asked Mick Jagger, you know, what do you think of not being able to sing these four songs? And he stands and he gets up and he says, well, you know, I, I'm not sure, but I'm sure the Chinese government has a very good reason why I'm not allowed to sing Brown Sugar in front of 8,000 50-year-old expats in Shanghai. Because, you know, and that's, that's kind of the, the attitude that I think a lot of foreigners bring to it is that we just don't understand why, why isn't that allowed. Again, t- taking a step back, understanding what's the priorities of the government and how they might affect decision making uh, is, is a key to live events for sure. And then after that, you know, again, dealing with those same kind of fan kind of uh, different preferences in the entertainment menu and stuff like that. You have a lot easier job selling a pop concert than you do selling a, you know, a hockey game or something like that here. I think that's just because the fan culture for pop music is so strong. Cause that's something, again, they can hold on to through their whole lives. Um, they don't have that break in the in their early in their most formative years. You know, there's there's so much reality television here, developing pop culture and developing different different kinds of avenues for people to be able to see that they can actually they can envision themselves as being that person up on stage. You know, the, the, the huge karaoke culture here, singing and you know doing your own personal recordings and, and and living that life as a as a pop star is is really not as as an imaginary pop star isn't really that difficult here. So it draws people a lot closer to, uh, to live events and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I want to, I I do want to talk about venues, which I I Mm -hmm. think because we take infrastructure across sports for granted over here. And so I, I, you know, I think it's a very interesting conversation that you wouldn't normally think to have when it Mm -hmm. comes to talking about sports, but when it comes to China, you have to, but before I get to that, you did a good job already and we've talked about defining kind of the fan culture in China. So I'm going to breeze past that, but you can revisit it if there's something else you want to say left over from what we talked about before. But, you know, it's about kind of understanding sports fans and strategies um, and strategies that you might be using in China on how to connect with them. And, you know, interestingly, we did uh, the podcast um, that we just released with Benjamin Wall, who is the head of China for Borussia Dortmund. And oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah. So we talked about <laughs> you guys are really doing a lot of sports. These days. We are. Um, <laughs> yeah. And we, we talked about how important it was for them. And I think a lot of sports teams uh, to really get in. I tell you about before the Vancouver Canucks came to Vancouver, my dad was a devout Montreal Canadiens fan. And I thought even though mm-hmm. he became a fan of the Canucks because they were our local team, I felt that he still kind of bled white and red um, and yeah. blue because, he, you know, as a kid growing up, he was a big Montreal fan. So I, I asked him about how important it is for you to get in now before really all the local Chinese colors start bleeding through their loyal fans um, Mm -hmm. and get in, you know, and how valuable it can be. So, um, you know, again, back to understanding sports fans and, and what are some of the strategies on how to connect with them? One of the things I think a lot of foreign organizations get wrong is that they need, they, they see what happened with Yao Ming in the NBA and they believe that that's a model they need to follow. And I, I don't think it necessarily is. Um, you don't need to have that. It helps, but you don't need to have that Chinese face to really develop a fan a fan base in China um, in terms of an athlete. What you need to do is invest. You need to make the you need to show them that you're here to be part of their daily life, and you can't be managing it from from New York. You can't be managing it from London, or you can't be managing it from Paris, wherever you are in the world, and expect people here to to care. You need to be on the you need a team on the ground that's active and and constantly engaging, constantly developing content that's going to connect with with locals. And if you do that, I think there's a lot of space that you can collect people uh, and really create a strong fan base. I've seen too many organizations that, that take it the other way where they're, um, like I said, organizing it, managing it from New York. They're, they're bound for failure. You can you can almost predict on exactly when it's going to happen that they're, they're going to pack up and, and go home because it's just not going to work out for them. Yeah. So I think that's probably where I would take that is just investing locally and, and trying to really run it on a local basis. Here I'll give the I'll give the NBA story here. I think it connects well with um with fan culture. Okay. Um. So the NBA, uh, in the, I think in the late seventies, the Washington Wizards were invited were invited, or at the time the Washington Bullets were invited over to come play an exhibition game in China, and they were the first NBA presence ever uh, here. And then in the early eighties, after David Stern 
took over the commissionership of the MBA, he identified China as an international market. He saw a lot of growth potential. And so he started from the beginning to make the MBA into a, a, a popular brand in China, like make it work in China. And back in the mid 80s, there was a gentleman named Ma Guo Li, and he was the head of CCTV Sports. And at that time, the MBA and CCTV Sports had negotiated an agreement where every week um, CCTV Sports would broadcast one or two games taped, right? And the MBA was responsible to, to get these tapes to CCTV, get them to China, get them to CCTV, and then CCTV would put them on the air. And I'm not sure exactly what was happening, but for some reason, the games weren't making it on the schedule. And so what David Stern did is he personally, he took the tapes, he got on a plane, he flew across to Beijing, and he sat in the lobby of CCTV waiting for Ma Guoli to come out for lunch to give him the tapes directly. Um, he took it upon himself to be the face to make sure that it was delivered to China and, and Ma Guoli received them directly. To this day, I mean, there was no, there was no big breakfast, there was no big dinner set up, there was no, you know, official reception. It was just David, David Stern acting as, as almost like an individual going there, sitting in the lobby of CCTV, the NBA commissioner sitting in the lobby there, no herald, you know, no, no announcement, no nothing like that, just waiting for him to come up for lunch. And to this day, Magwali still tells this story every time he, every time I see him on stage or doing any kind of presentation. And so you can just tell that the, the warmth that was created in the relationship just from that or that one action is still affecting the NBA relationship uh, with CCTV now, what, 40 years on. And it really set the tone for the whole, how the NBA was able to invest into the local market, establish themselves with, with good relationships. And then from there, uh, work with their local partners to really create a lot of, a lot of passionate fans for, for what's now the most popular sport, the most popular sport in China. Let's talk a little bit about venues to close this out. I mean, maybe we should define uh, what a venue, what, what it means, just in case anybody doesn't know. Uh, take 10 seconds to do that. Talk about uh, China's army of white elephants, and, and then we'll, we'll move on from there. So um, that's, that's asking what is a venue, that's a great question in China because they use the same word for any kind of, in the, in the documents, they use the same word for any kind of um, venue. And so that could be your local you know, running track that could be the local football pitch, the basketball court, or it could be an 80,000 seat, seat stadium in Shanghai. So they don't really distinguish that in the policy documents, which is, which is really, I think, funny. Traditionally, in the past 30 years, sports venues, you know, and let's take it as the bigger ones, the stadiums, the arenas, 10,000 seat plus, they've been used in, in a lot of ways to be a, a driver of infrastructure development where the local government will invest in to build a stadium because the city needs one. They feel the city needs one. And, and they'll use that as an infrastructure project to create jobs and drive investments and, and all the same things that, that great infrastructure plans can do without really a plan on how they're going to use it afterwards. And that's why I have this, this term of the army of white elephants in China, um, where you have all these stadiums and arenas and, and, and venues across China that are, that are built. You know, they could be international architectures design them, architects design them. There could be, uh, you know, beautiful, beautiful state of the art the minute they're opened. And then because they have no plan and they have no no real management team to take it over, they just kind of fall into disrepair. And it, it, they kind of fall in the cracks, actually, because a lot of these stadium developments, they're built by the central governments or they're driven by the central government. And then they're built by a local mayor or a local provincial leader to be kind of like a, a, a part of their resume to move on to the next job. And then it's kind of handed over to the local sports bureau after that to manage without giving them any resources or any any direction or any kind of ability to actually take on such a huge stadium. So whereas in the West, we have a whole industry of, of venue managers and, and, and all of the training and all of the um, education that's required to create these these great people that create such wonderful events that we all know in China, that traditionally it's been more of just given to the sports bureau and let them kind of figure out what to do with it later without actually giving them any resources to do it. So, you know, there's a lot of venues in China that are just beautifully built, but just left left to fall apart. What I will say though now is we're starting to see, and I think this is part of the whole, what I mentioned with the new reform, trying to drive consumption, is that they're trying to create those venue managers and create those workforce of talented people that can actually manage these venues and bring them to life. There's a lot of initiatives going on right now to to create those, you know, whether it's at universities or technical programs or whatever kind of um, education is needed, they're, they're really trying to create that workforce. So we'll see what happens there. There's a, you know, there's obviously a few really well-run venues in China, the Mercedes-Benz Arena in Shanghai and the Wukasong Arena in, in Beijing are probably top of the top of the list, but there's other ones around the country as well uh, that are good case studies on how a venue can be successful. But we'll have to wait and see what happens. 
Last question for you real quick. What uh, what are we expecting? Uh, talk to us a little bit about what you're going to see, what you expect to see for the 2022 Beijing Winter Olympics and how that might differ from uh, what happened in 2008. Right. So I think 2008 was a really eye-opening experience for a lot of people, including a lot of Chinese people. Um, they didn't really know how they were going. I mean, they had great plans and they had great execution team. And, and I think the people involved with the event knew what they were going to do. But I would say that for most Chinese people, it was quite a proud moment to see their country stand up and, and organize such a great event. The China today and the China then is is totally different. You know, what's happened in the past 20 years um, or 15 years is is never been seen on earth before, where China now is much more stronger, much more proud country that's going to be expecting a lot more. And and the world, I think, is also going to be expecting a lot more because they have that 2008 experience and they've seen, they've read all the news and they've seen all the growth of China in the past 15 years, that there's a lot higher expectations on what's going to be delivered. And then if you add in COVID, and all of the delays and all of the issues that that's created in the past year and a half, even if China's, you know, ridden the wave a little bit better than some other countries, it still had, a, had an effect, had a pretty serious effect here. So we'll have to wait and see what happens. It's kind of difficult to predict the results that are going to happen. But I think based on what I, you know, what I know about China and their resolve to make sure that they always present the best face and, and open their arms with really warm reception for everybody, it's going to be a successful event. And it might be the one that really breaks the breaks the back of, of um, some of the bad feelings that, that, that are going around in the world right now. Mm-hmm. All right, Greg, thanks so much for coming on the show, man. Really appreciate it. That's Greg Turner, founder and managing director of the Shenzhen High Performance Event Management. Greg, thanks for coming on the show, my friend. Hey, my pleasure. Growing a company is hard. Doing it in a foreign market? Exponentially so. The best piece of advice I can give you is not to do it alone. When you start looking across the pond for further expansion possibilities, and I sincerely hope that you do, make sure you choose the right partners to do it with. My good friends at WPIC Marketing and Technologies have almost 20 years of experience helping brands just like yours enter China. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Negotiation. And if you're interested in being a guest or want to connect with me or any of our team, please reach out to us at podcast at WPIC.co. And be sure to rate, comment, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Zai Jing.